right, good evening. Welcome to History Fix and the inaugural run of Behind the Scenes. This is a chance to meet History Fix and meet some of the folks who make the content of History Fix, ask them questions, and get a chance just to visit a little bit with what it is to do history and go behind history. I'm Will. I'm one of the principals of History Fix, along with my buddy Gary, who had an idea during COVID, and that was how do we get history together? How do we make it so you can get your hands on it? And how do you get a chance to take a look and go back? Tonight, we're going to start talking with some folks. And let's start this evening. We're going to start with Shane Seeley from Wide Awake Films. Shane, wow. First, you know, you and I have been friends for years, and I really appreciate you helping us come in and kick this series off. Why don't you introduce us a little bit to who you are and what you do there? Yeah, I'm Shane Steely. I uh, started Wide Awake Films in the uh, late 90s, but that was all kind of sparked by a real interest in history. Uh, when I was a kid, um, I kind of had a reading problem, and I would come from a family of voracious readers, and I went to a summer program, learned how to read, and history was kind of the first thing I started reading. I lived in Decatur, Illinois, got into Lincoln, and it was kind of my gateway into uh, the Civil War, and, and that's blossomed into uh, uh, kind of a combination of, of that history geekness with a video uh, filmmaking, visual storytelling geekness. And uh, now I'm surrounded by a bunch of people that share the same uh, affliction. And uh, we have a studio and we do a lot of stuff that um, uh, hopefully lights a spark on people to, to get interested in their past and, and, and pick up a book and visit a site or visit a historic structure. So that's what we're all about at Wide Awake Films. Cool. Well, I'm going to just out both of us and I'm going to go ahead and share some photos that people might like here. And that is Shane and I come through the to the history somewhat or have expressed that I love history through living history. And if you're looking at images now, you're seeing four images out of Shane's past, some of it recent past, some of it, well, maybe not quite so recent. <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, the color one you sent me today with the division flag in the background, is that a Chickamauga event? That is actually, and I was, uh, that was my unit I was talking to, but I was actually had a, a big, large video crew there filming that event. So um, that's what I look like, and I'd usually have a camera on my shoulder, but uh, yeah. I know the Chicken feeling. Chicken this. Dusty. They like Chicken that. Dusty. Well, we'll go there, and I'll go ahead and share some stuff from last weekend, and I'll go ahead and do the same thing to myself that I just did to you. Was just down at Camp Nelson National Monument. I can say now our second newest national park in the nation helping them with an interpretive event and we've got some photos from there last weekend so little housekeeping as we get started uh we're going to talk about several shows that shane has worked with we're going to talk a little bit about shane uh we'll just share with you guys right away if you're on the fence about history fix and want to get involved you can take a 20% off discount off the annual plan because Shane is here with us today. Uh, we send a discount code for all uh, organizations that work with us. Shane's is Wide Awake. Use the website to sign up, uh, www.historyfix.com. And when you check out, use Wide Awake in the discount code, and that'll give you 20% off the first year for the annual plan. I'll say this and I'll say this here, the annual plan is the best value. The additional money of a monthly plan is something that goes overwhelmingly to credit card fees, not to anything else. So we'd rather have you if you can keep the annual plan and stay behind. So, well, Shane, you talked a little bit about coming up through that program that got you reading history. Yeah. How did you get started in movie making? Movie making? Well, it it also, it kind of started reenacting. So when I turned 18, I decided that I could reenact and I wanted to, but I didn't know how to do it. I lived in South Central Kansas, not necessarily the Mecca for Civil War anything. Um, but I ended up getting into reenacting while I was attending the University of Kansas and I wanted to be a broadcast news anchor. That was my uh, object. I was really into journalism and writing and I'd been on the high school newspaper and I kind of got in that program and realized what I really liked doing was having a camera on my shoulder and editing my own stuff. And that kind of led me to start working at a, a big video production company here in the Midwest, Kansas City, which is where I still hail from. And um, I said, hey, 
1991, there's a big reenactment going on, the 130th anniversary of Wilson's Creek in Springfield, Missouri, not more than four hours from our facility. And I talked him into like letting me go down there and shoot it. Well, at the time, um, if you remember, uh, uh, time classic images, Jack, I think it's Jack Foley, some of those guys, they were doing the same thing. So I'd kind of uh, picked Jack's brain a few times and figured it out. and. And that was kind of my way into filmmaking. So we went and filmed this big national event. And then I took, I pre-sold $70,000 worth of documentaries on VHS, came back, made a one hour documentary, and they said, hey, let's do some more of this. And uh, that's how it kind of started. And since then, I've, I've filmed a lot of events. Uh, my business partner, Ed, um, was with me at, at Video Post and was with me at every event. And uh, uh, he still uh, is, and it's something that, uh, we just share, that was kind of how we got started. And that really led into museum work and then that led into stock footage for American experience and um, big broadcast shows. And then that kind of led into, hey, you got all these documentaries, you ever done anything for television? And so, and that's where it kind of progressed into, you know, regional and national documentary work. Um, not just around Civil War, we started in Civil War, we've gotten into Revolutionary War titles, which uh, are on, his, on History Fix, we've gotten into uh, some other areas as well, so um, I like it all, so um, it's really fascinating to me, I'm really curious, and um, I just like reading and, and learning. And, and history is stories. So I see you guys jumping in and jumping out there. I uh, do know here on Facebook, I see the chat. So if you've got questions for Shane or for me or anything, feel free to throw it in and we will go ahead and answer where we can. Uh, we're running, your feed is about 20 seconds behind us. So it'll take a little bit of time, but that's just sort of the way of live streaming these days. So. Well, Shane, I'm laughing because Jack Foley is somebody I spoke with as we started History Fix. I've known him for years and we sounded him out and he's been very supportive here as well. So you talk about those documentaries and those regional documentaries. Let's turn into the first of the four programs that you have here. Uh, gang, Shane's got four major programs here and there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that really many of them are their own pieces. So we'll get through some of those. But probably my single favorite piece that you have here shane is the american artist yeah the american artist um it is a biopic documentary about the life of george caleb bingham um he was a missourian um and quite a prolific artist but you know that project started um as a lot of ours do with a call from the people that have stewarded his house and his community, Arrow Rock, Missouri, which used to be kind of the the uh, starting point on the Santa Fe Trail. It was a river town, um, the, the river jump course, but um, it, at that time it was a river town. And that's where Bingham got his start. And so they called us to say, hey, can you do a documentary on, on this guy um, for PBS? And we said yes. And dove in and, and got that project going and just learned a lot. I mean, he's a fascinating character. Um, the, the documentary is, um, you know, we just nerded out on it. Like literally every painting in 4K on, in the documentary that he painted, I filmed with a camera in the art gallery where it was because Bingham's a luminist and a luminist, you know, really absorbs the light of a room. And it's really interesting to see them in person. So, and then just we're able to kind of recreate his life story, which is really a story of the state of Missouri and its people kind of in this cauldron of the American civil war. And his work was kind of a, definitely a, a through line there to, to help us really teach a lot of history. Um, that's really complex and it's not really, black and white out here and, and, and his story is really complex and uh, it was interesting. I, it was really humbling. I'm not an art uh, guy per se, but um, it's it's interesting what um, uh, it's gotten me um, into um, uh, at least that kind of art from the 19th century. I guess it sure has because you've got a piece right over your shoulder there. I guess uh, that's one of my more favorite. Go ahead and talk about what we see over your shoulder right now. <laughs> Yeah, that's Jolly Flatboatman, and it's one of two versions of that painting that he did. That's my favorite, and it's just, uh, just a really, you know, interesting. We My off studio is, like, right by the Missouri River, um, and that's really the other part of that story. It's all about 
kind of steamboat travel and riverboat excursions up and down uh, the Missouri and and that whole lifestyle because they were the super high rays well before railroads came into the West. It was uh, the river traffic. And, um, and our, our, our place is also right beside the Steamboat Arabia Museum here in Kansas City. I always got to plug them. It's a wonderful place if you're here. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. It was really a, a lot of history tied into uh, an hour. It ended up winning a regional Emmy. Um, we had uh, we begged and pleaded and got Keith David, who's uh, one of Ken Burns narrators, to narrate the piece. Um, just an amazing actor and uh, who's had a great set of pipes and it's great to work with. And then we have some tracks from Yo-Yo Ma in, in the uh, piece. And we had some original compositions by uh, a local Kansas City in as well. So just a great group team effort. It wasn't just me. It's our entire Keith Johnson, my creative director, co-directed it with me. Um, Got to give all the good stuff cre credit to him. And uh, just a lot of people, you know, filmmaking is a team sport. And, uh, you know, um, you know, you direct and, uh, you know, um, when when the credit's good, you got to share it, and when it's bad, it's all on you. You shoulder <laughs> so, it absolutely. Yeah. There's no two so directing here's no two ways. Well, I got to say, it, uh, it's interesting how as you and I have known each other for years uh, through both the history side and the media side, you were able to toss something over for me. We've got the show, the sample room, which shows up on History Fix, and later in that first season, you see a set. I had dug for like 18 months going, what does the inside of a pub look like in the middle of the 19th century? We know very early and revolutionary era. We know in cowboy era. And it was you and I talking about Bingham that allowed me to have the snap because at the DIA, the Detroit Institute of Arts here in Michigan, there's that one painting and that is to mm -hmm. date. And Bingham self-painted himself into it, did a self-portrait there. Yeah. Uh, no ego going on with that guy at all. <laughs> but that was the only it's the only look at the inside of a of a drinking establishment I think I've ever been able to find for yep. that era in American history. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you can learn a lot of history through his paintings. Uh, I mean, when you look at uh, you talk to a lot of people that know 19th century clothing, which you and I both share an obsession of, um, uh, you know, I check, I, I don't profess to know the 1840s clothing at, at that point. So I call, you know, people like Ben Jenkins and people that I know who know it well. And, you know, and they're like, yeah, everything in that painting is right on because he's painting it from his time. So it's really, you know, a real kind of lifting the hood on that whole decade, 1840s, 1850s. And, and the more you study them, you just realize they, they're not cavemen. You know, everything they have is mass produced. Um, they're traveling back and forth like we do and, uh, you know, on riverboats and railroads and they have telegraph communications. And it's just uh, the more you learn about history, sometimes the more you realize how uh, recent it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you throw Ben's name out there and Aaron and a lot of the material culture guys yeah. you've worked with and I've known for years. It's fun to see the community come up there, uh, not only the filmmaking community, but also the history community and how those two are in some ways so very similar. They are. Um, yeah. Matter no, of fact, I, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, to that end, there's a couple of pieces that are bonuses to the American artists. Uh, particularly, I was taken by Nadi the Dugout Canoe. It seems like there's some filmmaking serendipity there. Do you have a story or you want to introduce people a little bit there? Yeah. So we knew we wanted to recreate um, Fur Traders on the Missouri, which is a classic painting. It's the one at the Met. We had heard that that painting at the Met back when they had docents that would stand by and like count people looking at paintings, they were told if there was a fire at the Met, grab that one. And, you know, it's like one of their top paintings, uh, they claim, because they also discovered it, right, in 1930, you know, just randomly, you know, in some art gallery. Anyway, so we knew we wanted to recreate it. I needed a dugout canoe. And you know how it works. Um, this is in 20, early, early, uh, whenever we started doing that, early in Facebook time. So I just threw up on Facebook. Hey, anyone know of a dugout canoe? <clears throat> and this is, of course, you know, filmmaking. This was seven days out from when we needed to shoot it. Um, still hadn't like sourced it and the gods were, um, you know, staring down well on me and you, you, you believe it. Um, somebody says, Hey, I know a guy in a dugout canoe who happens to be traversing the Missouri and he'll be there next Wednesday. And I'm like, what? Turns out he's like related to like Lewis and Clark and this is the greatest guy, um, real free spirit. And, 
um, he did a great job and came in and um, we picked him up on the Missouri and then we shot all those scenes at uh, a local Corps of Engineers Lake, Lake Giacomo. And uh, uh, it was pretty interesting to uh, uh, shoot it there. That's what the old, the old places used to look like. Uh, that's pretty cool. Glad for luck like that because it was really fun to see and it added a lot of production value to a show. Always the question when doing history, how do you make it as big as possible? And that definitely added to it. Yeah, no, it did. And he was just a, uh, you know how it is too, Will, when you have a good presence and a good energy on set and, and that's what he was. And, you know, and sometimes when that's on set and then even when you put it in a shot, uh, and even viewers may not know, but that energy, you know, circulates even when you're watching stuff. So, and that's who uh, that that's who that guy was. Yeah, cool. Well, let's talk about a little bit. Let's transition a bit to another show. Let's talk a little bit about energy that maybe isn't quite as good. And you've already alluded to it. But uh, in the run up in the late Annabella Maria era, your neck of the woods was not necessarily the most peaceable place to be over there. Let's talk a little bit uh, about Bad Blood. Yeah, Bad Blood. Um, that's a project that started um, uh, as a legacy effort. It's basically about the border war between Missourians, a, a slave state, and the free, the, the Kansas Territory, the settlers of Kansas Territory. At that time, uh, when Kansas was a territory, it was to be decided by popular sovereignty, which meant Congress was passing the buck to the people that settled Kansas to decide whether it entered the Union slave or free. And so that border became a real symbolic, uh, 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 you know, place. And, and uh, it was something that uh, a lot of people from both sides converged on the state and it caused a lot of conflict and trauma, which we captured in a 90 minute documentary um, that we did uh, um, about that effort. And um, yeah, it was a lot, again, just one of those things i'd always been into the civil war i'm from kansas and it was something that i didn't know intimately until we really ply into it you know with every documentary we do we're reading i'm reading our research team's reading we call the people that know it intimately inside and out backwards and forwards and um and that's what we do that's how we attack this stuff and uh try to make it as, as objective and um as we can and try to make sure it looks right because, uh, you know, I'm a nerd for that kind of stuff. And I know all my friends in the community are too. And, and I feel like, you know, even like I watched Saving Private Ryan, I didn't know World War II uniforms at all, but I knew that's what it looked like when I saw it, right? And I think that um, I really try to do that too and make sure that we check that box for the people that do know what they're looking at and who do know the history. And, uh, but it also comes back to a good story. You know, um, uh, people need stories, so. Well, that that's a great thing. Let me ask this: Is there uh, what air, uh, what years does Bad Blood cover? What what range? How far? How where do you start and where do you end in that project? I think Bad Blood takes you up till 1860, and it starts in roughly 1854 with the Kansas Nebraska Act. Okay, so it's, it covers a six year period. But, um, but there's a lot going on out there in those six years. Oh, absolutely! No, there's a lot of uh, conflict. There's a lot of uh, domestic terrorism, arguably, um, going on on both sides. There's a lot of coercion. There's a lot of ballot stuffing. It's got, it's an American saga, right? It's got it all. And, uh, and we try to tell it, um, in an interesting way and, uh, and really, you know, everything's shot like on location where it happened. Um, you know, we're, we're using, uh, the people that know this history well as recreations and reenactors so it's uh you know it's interesting um it, it was a lot of fun making it big big team just still brings great memories together any fate you talk about great memories any favorite memories anything stand mm -hmm. out that uh, that's a great story from seth either the history of it or the filming of it you'd love to bring up no uh you know no it's just yeah that i, I think so i think you know, we were able to use some locations here in the Kansas City area, um, Missouri Town being one of them. It's at Lake Chacomo. It's a really cool set that was rebuilt by Ang Lee Ride with the Devil film there. And they did a bunch of uh, a bunch of really nice restorations inside and out. So uh, and it's a great site. And we filmed there like eight times now. But I think anytime I can go out to that place, which is a uh, uh, like it's like going back into the 1860s, 1850s, and it's really 
uh, bucolic and, and just a beautiful place. So that's always my good memories. And I've filmed a, a lot of stuff there. So cool. It's kind well, of our back lot, if you will. Nice. Not bad. It's great to have a back lot. Uh, let me detour into the questions because Rob Schenk just uh, chimed up in the comments here. And he and I'll give you a chance to brag on some other stuff I know you can brag on, Shane. Rob asks, how did you choose the name of your film company? Ready? Go. <laughs> <laughs> Wide Awake Films. Well, if you look up the Wide Awakes on Wikipedia, there is a party called the Wide Awakes that helped get Abraham Lincoln elected in 1860. And um, that's where we got our name. And they basically started as 12 people in Hartford, Connecticut in February of 1860. Eight months later, using the Telegraph and the newspapers, they had basically uh, uh, multiplied to become, five, rumor says, 500,000 across the United States, mainly young men who marched at night um, with torches, um, wearing uh, a rubber cape and cap that had no nap, and that was allegedly why they were called the Wide Awakes, and they were up at night. And uh, they marched in, in uh, get to get Abraham Lincoln elected president. We did a documentary for a streaming platform about them just recently, and uh, that's where we got the name. And, and it's always just kind of meant battlefield preservation, historical preservation, staying awake to history and, and how uh, how we can kind of continue to light a spark for people, you know, with visual medium, you know, it's a lot of, it, it gets right to the core of it. And uh, sometimes books aren't as uh, prevalent as we'd like them to be, or as maybe we've had that. And if we can entice someone with a three minute video or a 60 minute documentary, that's what we're all about. Absolutely. And that's a project uh, or that's an entity, the Wide Awakes is somebody who's finally getting a little bit more play. You know, I'll just flat out say you both on other platforms in history fix, you and I have both done stuff recently about it. So I'm, gl I'm glad to see that story yeah. better told. Yours is way more comprehensive and definitely a story worth checking out both in the history and in your storytelling of it. So I'm glad that it's out there. Well, thank you. One last comment, you know, just to show how nerdy we are in the research that we did for that documentary, we discovered that Lincoln's son was a wide awake. We found proof of it, and no one had. Even uh, uh, the Smithsonian didn't know that. So, you know, it's like, hey, we contributed to the uh, to the historical record, you know, as part of that. We're not and just coming in and making a documentary. No, how do we collect the body of information, Absolutely. and then how do we take it and make it interesting? Because if we do that, you know, I, I, I tell people, look, good, good story, good history, good material culture you're gonna hit yeah. you hit that trifecta and you've got it and that sits well so let's uh let's take that trifecta and let's go to 1862 uh, i know this is not your first time with this battle but this is the project we have on history fix talk to me about the battle at shiloh the battle at shiloh well um that was that sparked with uh, one of our long-term clients, the American Battlefield Trust. They were called the Civil War Trust at the time. And they commissioned us to do an animated map about the Battle of Shiloh. Um, we had an opportunity to go film the Shiloh National Event. I believe that's the 130th event, um, which we went down and we secured the rights filmed a lot of great footage. I'm not sure if you were there, Will, but um, it was some great impressions there. Big event. And we took that footage and then made a long documentary um, from the uh, from that footage and created a title uh, called uh, 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 The Devil's Own Two Days. And um, it was it was great. But that was the second time I had done that. I had also shot the Shiloh reenactment on the uh, uh, no. The 130th was the first one I shot. I'm sorry, the 140th was the second one. So, but I'd done it twice, and uh, it's just something that we've revisited a few times. And you know, it's a great story. It's a you know, to me, the Shiloh is when you know the common soldier kind of realizes what they signed up for. And um, uh, and I'm, I have an affinity for the Western Civil War, and it's always been uh, a great place to visit if you've never been there. It's amazing. It's one of the most pristine battlefields in the national park system. And uh, there's just a great story there. It's uh, it's wonderful. So um, it's been fun. And that one um, has a lot of them, animated maps that um, I just revisited recently for something we're doing that were just superb done by our animation team. Um, uh, it, it's really puts you into the battle. You understand uh, what's going on uh, from kind of a drone level view, if you will. 
And, um, and then we have a lot of kind of interesting approaches to the content there. We um, decided to kind of break the wall and, and let the uh, actual participants and, and eyewitnesses, if you will, of the battle speak directly into the lens. Um, and we're speaking their own words that they've written, but we kind of took a different approach with that, which was, uh, it was a little interesting. Um, I, I still think uh, it holds up and uh, uh, it's, it's worth a view. So you'll learn a lot about the fight. I know that. Let's go just a little bit deeper because that's something I really wanted to dig into with this one is the fourth wall break and the characters. How do you, how in this documentary do you talk about the Battle of Shiloh? Talk to me about the individual characters a little bit. Yeah, we kind of, you know, we always want to change perspective. So um, we have, uh, you know, uh, I think Lou Wallace's wife, who's coming to visit him as a character. We've got Henry Villard, who's a, uh, a uh, newspaper reporter, New York newspaper journalist, she's there on the scene, one of the few. Um, and then a few other like uh, soldiers that were in the ranks taking their accounts and just just kind of uh, taking the story from that point of view, you know, how it transformed them. It was like no one had ever witnessed this stuff I mean, on this level on the North American continent. And it was a horrible two days of, uh, you know, kind of Here's what modern warfare looks like. It redefined it. So that, I think that was interesting from their perspective to to kind of get a, a feel for that. So very cool. Well, let's switch over. There's one more piece that we have, and there's a number of things I want to talk about the piece, and I want to talk about the behind the scenes because it's just something near and dear to my heart. Talk to us about August Light. Yeah, August Light is a documentary that kind of chronicles. Missouri's entry and it's it's really about what the Battle of Wilson's Creek but it, it really kind of brings you into this interesting story of Missouri a border state um, whose population though slaveholding had voted against secession um, but it was quickly um, something that uh, was secured by the by the northern government to make sure that um, you know being the northernmost slave state that uh, it was securely in, in United States control and uh, so it takes you through all the kind of tumultuous events uh, uh, that that led up to the big battle of Wilson's Creek and the um, first killing of a, a Union general, Nathaniel Lyons, uh, at the at the battlefield there. And we had done the interpretive film at the National Park Service, and so as part of that effort, we um, were able to shoot all of the recreations in this documentary on the actual anniversary of the battle in the exact spaces and locations where those events transpired. So it was really a, a crazy shoot. It was hot, it was like 102. We were running, literally running water to every animal and person on set between every take as people were in cornfields wearing all blue wool uniforms as regulars. And so uh, it was a great memory and, and we just love it. That's my. Uh, first Civil War battlefield ever visited, Wilson's Creek. And uh, to be able to do a documentary on it and, and to also uh, have the film uh, that our team did playing at the interpretive, at the visitor center there is pretty cool. So That's cool. And didn't you just re-up the visitor center film there or yeah. some more interpretive projects there that obviously we don't have here, but go to Wilson's Creek, check it out. And some guys you and I both know, known as the first section, which are living historians who make their history trade, pulling artillery with horses. And it's pretty magnificent to see. You've got some great stuff there if people can get out to the battlefield. Absolutely. And it's one of the best Civil War small arms collections on display uh, in the park system. It rivals Chickamaugas. And uh, we did a piece where we hired a current army uh, sharpshooting instructor and sniper to come in and um, test fire uh, seven different uh, uh, weapons uh, using ballistics and um, and kidney gels and stuff like that. We shot with a phantom real slow-mo, so a lot of fun. Um, and we all got to fly, live fire all the weapons as well, so that's always a bonus on those shoots. Oh, well, fantastic. And folks, you're going to find that out here. We're not just here to push you to help us at History Fix and Subscribe. There's a lot of history everywhere, and as we meet more folks, you know, Shane and I are passionate. We've got a lot of experiences. Other folks will. We'll keep talking about this you know there's stuff you can't see here go to wilson's creek go to a national park go see it and dan saban says hello and dan hello back to you in illinois glad to have you with us this evening so 
Shane, when we speak about history, there's someone who we have lost just to years. And if people log in here and check out the bonuses for the uh, August Light piece, we get to still be with him. Would you introduce, introduce us to this I'll say character because, I mean, face it, he's a human being, but Ed's a character. Would you go ahead and make the introduction, please? Sure, sure. I, I had the privilege to be with the chief historian emeritus for the National Park System, Ed Bars, um, repeatedly on various battlefields um, and also at Wilson's Creek. And uh, Ed had kind of done a lot of early uh, writing on Wilson's Creek and um, it was a big, uh, big piece of history to him. So um, we were able to record him at every location, giving um, the Ed Bars talk on um, uh, Wilson's Creek. And we, it was just, it's always a privilege to be with Ed. Um, you know, uh, he's just was a, an amazing guy, an amazing American, you know, uh, amazing veteran. And just, just, uh, I, I'm really a better guy having uh, hung out with Ed Bars. And uh, yeah, that's worth checking out um, because, you know, Ed's great on camera, but it's all the stuff between, between the takes that is the most fun with Ed too. Cause uh, he was a Marine through and through 24 seven and uh, just a lot of fun to hang out with. And uh, I miss him dearly. Well, I got I got to be with him and hear him the anniversary, the 150th anniversary of Antietam on the battlefield. So you're certainly right. But you say he gave the Ed Bars talk. For those folks who aren't as close as you and I are, maybe you get to describe the character a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Ed would... I hung out with Ed a lot. He would get on a battlefield, position himself in a crossed-armed way, and he had a swagger stick. He always carried it with him. He would close his eyes and start, and everyone's got an Ed Bars impression. I probably won't do it, but, and start basically uh, photographically recounting what he knew of what transpired on that spot and really get into minutia, uh, character details, um, all the, you know, fun stuff, poke fun at people, generals he didn't like, and uh, just, it was just a really colorful talk. That's why, that's, I mean, the guy did that until his late 90s, you know, he was constantly walking, out walking people half his age, you know, and uh, just loved it. He, that was his uh, mission in life. He loved being on battlefields and telling you what happened there. Um, yeah, and sometimes he'd do it when he wasn't supposed to be on the spot he was supposed to be on. I was with him in those two, you know. Wow. And they'd come out yelling at him. He'd be like, okay, 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 sir, thank you, you know. Um, Ed, he's just uh, he's quite a guy, quite a guy. Wow. Well, you know, I'm glad that we've got six or seven pieces through the bonuses of August like to be able to keep Ed with us and hear some stories, at least from that battlefield. So that's pretty exciting. Um, <clears throat> we've got stuff from Mount Vernon on History Fix, and I know that that's not a Wide Awakes film thing, but it is. You want to talk a little bit uh, about living history in Mount Vernon and movie making? Yeah, we, you know, um, Civil War was always kind of our entry point into a lot of this, and we did a lot of content um, for the Civil War Trust, which is now the American Battlefield Trust, which is also doing Revolutionary War stuff, but... Our first foray was when our client at the American Battlefield Trust went over to Mount Vernon and uh, took over there and kind of we, we were fortunate enough that uh, he had the confidence that we knew nothing about the American Revolution, but um, we could take our same discipline and our same skills, our same attention to detail, our same respect for reenactors and may, mostly reverence of the history and, 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 and try to tell a great story. And uh, so we're able to do that through uh, four different pieces that I believe you have four, right, Will? Uh, we've got we've um, got a number of them. I think there may yeah. one of the pieces you've done may be limited to Visitor Center there, the 4D piece. I that. We don't because that, and that's again, folks go to yeah. Mount Vernon. Go right, see it right. because that's worth, that's worth getting out there and seeing. But yeah, it's, it's, it, it's just been... Those are great pieces. There's a lot of animated maps and animation in them to help kind of tell the big picture of the American Revolution. And mainly through, in that instance, the prism of uh, George Washington, you know, an amazingly complex American character who I've had the privilege to read about, learn about, walk in his steps, hang out in his studio, meet the experts who know more than I'll ever know about him. Uh, they've forgotten more than I'll ever know about him. And, uh, and just really... 
uh, learn a lot about um, a really amazing guy who was in the right place at the right time. And uh, um, so that's been a real privilege there. And those titles have been wonderful and just something that uh, I've learned just a great deal about a part of history I didn't know about. And we've been able to tell some great stories that I think uh, every that are really something that a lot of Americans need to pause and go back and and check out. You know, um, we've got the 250th anniversary of the United States happening in 2026, and you know, yep. a lot of our efforts right now will are to kind of direct some attention and focus back to that time and and to really kind of re-examine the American principles and and what what has led to this country, what's been successful, maybe what hasn't. And uh, it's time to do that. I know in the 70s, man, I mean, that was like uh, the centennial, was it 1976, you know, I remember that uh, big time and it really was inspirational to me. Um, you know, I still see those barns with the kind of the centennial logo painted on them. And, yep. um, and I wistfully think about how that had an impact on me to where, you know, now I'm still, you know, kind of spreading the historical gospel uh, at 55, you know, when I was in my teens and, you know, earlier. So I, hopefully we can do that the, in 2026 and beyond. And, and and you really use the visual medium to, you know, uh, engage people, especially our youth. I really think that they need to they need to know history and they need to understand it works and all, you know, what what happened and, and, and examine that and know it so uh, they can move forward. It's It's important. And I feel like that's our biggest mission. Fantastic. Well, if folks are asking a few questions here, I don't have any okay. new ones, but I've got a couple for you here that go with this. And that is not the what's coming up, but the wish list right now. And that is first question is, what's one story that you've wanted to tell that you haven't been able to yet? Sherman's March. But oh. we're, uh, yeah, Sherman's March. I, I'd like to get into that. My ancestor was along the way. Um, I've been deeply reading on it. I've been writing on it. So we're working on some various avenues there. I think it's a really compelling story. Uh, it's a real American story. Um, uh, it's it's multifaceted. And, uh, and the logistics side of it's just the data wonk in me is really uh, interested in, in telling that story, too, because uh, it's interesting from a lot of different angles. So that's one I, I really would like to revisit and uh, I think re-examine. You know, I think uh, I think he kind of got the shaft, honestly. And uh, I think that we should take a look back at, at what he did do and how many lives he did save. Very cool. OK, let me throw another qu history question at you. We've talked Civil War. We've talked and the lead up to it. And we've talked the American Revolution. What's an era that you'd like to do something historically and that you haven't been able to yet? World War One. We haven't done much. We we're uh, we're looking for those projects. I like. I think that's a great story to tell. World War One. I, I think there's more World War Two stories to tell. Um, the other thing is, I think there's a lot of Korean War stories to tell um, that uh, are out there. That I knew. I know some vets, more Korean War vets than I have World War Two vets, honestly. And uh, uh, I think their their stories worthy. And my dad was a Vietnam vet, so I think that's that's always uh, something that to, that needs retold. So, and then we're looking at projects that, uh, you know, we do a lot of work and for the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, um, been very fortunate to hang out with a lot of Medal of Honor recipients and uh, uh, they're just a special breed of American. And uh, I think uh, that's a story um, that needs told as well. Uh, all Americans need to understand uh, how you earn that medal and uh, what it means. I love it, and I love it that you say it the right way. Earn the medal, not awarded the medal. You know, there's definitely an earning there. So Absolutely. Well, Shane, I'm at the end of questions here. Let me give you last word here before we remind folks of how to find this. Yeah, last word is, hey, I think uh, keep supporting what Will's doing. It's like, uh, I like it, Will. You're really putting a lot of great content in one spot um, that needs to be uh, it curated and you're doing a great job with it and we're uh, we're glad to be a part of this and uh, I just support the mission and we want to help you guys uh, succeed and anything we can do we're here so yeah history fix I love it cool well thanks a lot for that uh, flip over folks you can see here there's the wide awake films logo uh, and there is the discount code for 20% off the first year of the annual plan which the use of the code wide awake 
we are streaming History Fix on the website, but we also have six branded apps, uh, Apple, Google, Roku, Amazon Fire. So once you sign up, you could sign up there, but the discounts only work if you sign up through the website. So we'd love to have you check it out. There's a seven day free trial. Uh, we'll be back next week, and I'll just give a pitch right here. Friend of both uh, Shane's and mine, Greg Starbuck, I uh, did a documentary oh, yeah. in his historic space, and we'll get to sit and talk with Greg about the One Piece next week. But for here, Shane, thanks so much for helping us kick this off, and just appreciate the time. So Yeah, glad to do it, Will. Thank you very much. Great. Everybody, thanks for spending your time with History Fix. We'll see you next Thursday. Have a great evening here. Thank you.